Colgate Tooth Powder for a breath that's sweet. And Halo Shampoo to glorify your hair. Present Edward G. Robinson as the star of The Woman in the Window in your theater of romance. Tonight, on your theater of romance, Colgate Tooth Powder and Halo Shampoo bring you the Robert Coleman adaptation of the international picture, Woman in the Window, with one of America's foremost stars, Sir Edward G. Robbins. And so do you on Theater of Romance, presented every Tuesday evening by Colgate Tooth Powder and Halo Shampoo, comes our play, The Woman in the Window, and our star, Edward G. Robinson. I don't know how long I had been asleep. Just before I dozed off, I had been thinking about the woman in the window. It was a life-size portrait in oils of a singularly striking and beautiful woman, and it was displayed in the window of the art gallery next door to the club. I had been thinking, if I were not a middle-aged man with a wife and three children, I, uh... Hmm. Well, the next thing I remember was a voice coming to me as if from a great distance. Professor Wanley. 10.30, Professor Wanley. 10.30. I said it's 10.30, sir. Hmm? Uh, what's that? 10.30, sir. You asked me to remind you. Oh. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you. I, I must have fallen asleep. Outside the club, I stopped for one more look at the lovely portrait of the woman in the window. As I stood there looking at it, a strange thing happened. My eyes seemed to be playing tricks on me. A face identical with the one in the painting suddenly materialized on the surface of the glass. It didn't occur to me that it was only a reflection until she spoke. You like it? Why, uh... Why, yes, yes. Uh, very much. What's the matter? Did I startle you? No, I, I thought I was seeing double. You uh, did pose for it, didn't you? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Well, do you own the painting? <laughs> no, I wish I did. Then I wouldn't have to come over here to watch people's faces. <laughs> Is that what you do? Now and then, when I'm lonely. Tonight? I was alone, and I don't like to be. Well, did you uh, watch my face? Oh, yes. Did I react poorly? I mean, uh, normally? Well, there are two general reactions. One is a, a kind of solemn stare for the painting. And the other? The other is a long, low whistle. <laughs> And uh, what was mine? I'm not sure, but I suspect that in another moment or two, you might have given a long, low, solemn whistle. <laughs> I had meant to buy a one drink, then excuse myself and go on my way. After all, I did have a lecture to deliver early the next morning, and... After all, I was a married man, even if my wife and family were away on vacation. But I found myself ordering a second drink and finally walking her home. When she asked me to come in for one more, it seemed the most natural thing in the world. It was midnight, and I was just taking my leave when the door of the apartment was flung open. And there on the threshold stood a man. He was a tall, heavily built man in a well-tailored business suit. He looked from me to the girl and back to me again. And then he spoke. Well, who are you? Why, my name John, is... John, darling, this gentleman was admiring my portrait in the window of the page. I told you. I told you. John, you, you don't understand. The professor and I were just... Why, uh, stop that, you fool. Who? Huh? Now, look here. I don't know who you are. I don't want any trouble. Who I only... calls me? I'll show you who... John, stop John, it. John, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Don't... He was like a crazy man. I tore at his hands, trying to break his iron grip at my throat, but it was no use. My head swam, and a curtain of darkness dropped in front of my eyes. My legs weakened and crumpled under me. The last thing I remember was something being thrust into my right hand, something cold and metallic and sharp. But my last ounce of strength, I grasped it and held on. 
Then, with an agonizing effort, I lifted my arm and struck. And struck again, and again, and again. Is he... Is he dead? Yes. What are we going to do? I don't know. Call the police, I suppose. Uh, what, uh, what was his name? Howard. John Howard, that's what he told me. Well, don't you think that was it? I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. I only saw him maybe two or three times a week. Where'd you meet him? On a train, very casually. Why? Well, who knows at all about you and him? Nobody, unless he told someone, which I doubt. Why? Well, I was just wondering if anyone could have seen him coming in here tonight. No, no, I'm sure not. He he wouldn't even get out of the cab if there was anyone about. Do you think there's something we can do? Do you? I don't want to go to jail. I'll try to keep calm, will you? Let's think about it for a minute. They'll never believe what happened. No, I'm afraid they won't. They'll make it some kind of murder. I know they now, will. please. I have no feeling about him. He was trying to kill me. There's no question about that. If you hadn't put those scissors into my hand, I'd be dead. But whatever they believe, I'm ruined. My whole life, my marriage, my professorship. I'm sorry. I was wondering. Yes. I was wondering if we had the nerve or something. Something pretty dangerous. It would shut the door on us completely if we were caught. Anything, anything. I'll risk anything. Well, we'll have to work fast. What are you going to do? Well, first I imagine we should try to get rid of the more obvious means of identification. I'm sorry, but this has to be done. Is there much blood? Almost none outside, fortunately. Oh, uh, maybe a blanket we could wrap him in? I think so. Ah. Ring, watch, billfold. No letters or anything with a name on it. Some initials on the back of this watch. C.M. C.M.? He told me his name was Howard. All right, uh, tie it all up and tomorrow get on one of the ferries. Uh, not during a rush hour. And uh, drop it overboard. And be very careful you aren't seen. The, the money, too? Can't we split that? No, we... Well, you might as well keep it if you wish. I can't see how that could be traced. How, how about the watch? Those initials are set in diamonds and rubies. It seems... Now, do peculiar. exactly as I tell you. Otherwise, we might as well give ourselves up now. All right, all right, I will. We've got to think of everything. We can't afford to overlook one detail. Where are you going to take it? Well, it's better that you don't know. It's better that we don't even know each other's names. Oh, I, I won't see you again, I suppose. Well, that will depend on circumstances. For both of our sakes. Let's hope this ends the whole thing completely and forever. I drove out of town on the Henry Hudson Parkway. There was a toll bridge there, but I had to risk it. I had my dime ready in my hat. I was going to hand it to the attendant on the move. I didn't dare stop for fear he might see what was there in the car. Hey! Hey, hold it there! Hold it! Uh, what's the trouble? Just my hand. Or was it a dime? Uh, never mind. Here's another. Oh, uh, couldn't have gone far. Well, that's all right. If you find it later, you can have it. In a hurry? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, here. Hey! Hey, wait! Yes? The penny. Oh, I, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thanks for the dime if I find it. As I drove on... The throbbing of the car's engine seemed to be echoing the sentence that was rung over and over again through my mind. I've killed a man. I've killed a man. I've killed a man, and I'm going to hide his body. Powder and Halo Shampoo bring you the second act of Woman in the Window, starring Edward G. Robinson. The fact that I'd killed a man of self-defense didn't lessen my feeling of horror at what I'd done. 
And even if a jury were to believe my story, there were other considerations than just my own safety. My wife and my children. The disgrace to my family. And to the university where I taught. No, I had chosen the only way out. I firmly believe that. That evening, I dropped into the bar at the Burgers Club. Michael Barkstein was there. He was reading the late edition of the journal. Richard! Richard, did you see this? No, uh, what? It says Claude Mazard, the public utilities tycoon, was brutally murdered. His body was found in the brush right near the Bronx River Parkway extension. Claude Mazard? Yes, know him? Oh, I know. Uh, I've heard of him, of course. Yes, I... Well, here's Frank Laylor. He'll know all the details. I'm sorry to be late. I guess you've seen the news. Yes, and we can't wait to hear the inside dope. Oh, Oh, it's great stuff, knowing a district attorney. I think we can be pretty confident about this one. It looks uh, easy to you? Not exactly easy, but not too tough. Plenty of clues, eh? Sure, we even have a fairly good description of the murderer. Hmm? Uh, what, uh, what's he like? Oh, he weighs in the neighborhood of 160 pounds, wears a size 8 shoe, and he was wearing a brown worsted suit. You know all that? We even know his blood type. You see, he scratched his hand lifting the body over a fence. Yes, but uh, a trace like that on a barbed wire fence. Did I say barbed wire fence? Well, didn't you? No, I didn't. Well, <laughs> what other kind could a man more naturally scratch his hand on, huh? Well, it was a barbed wire fence, of course. <laughs> and that scratch will help identify him, too. Oh, I don't know about that, Richard. Well, I, I've got a scratch on my hand, and uh, I was wearing a brown suit last night. <laughs> now, look, stop trying to throw cold water on my face. <laughs> Naturally, we have to have more to go on than little clues like that. Well, tell us the rest of it, man. Well, the police theory is this. Mazard had a sweetheart. Either a man was already with her or he came in during Mazard's call, and the lady preferred this man over Mazard. Oh. Well, have they uh, found this girl yet? No, not yet. But we still have an ace in the hole. Oh, Mazard's associates had hired a bodyguard to follow him secretly at all times. Well, have they, uh, have they, uh, questioned this man? No, we haven't been able to locate him yet, either. Hmm. A missing bodyguard and an unknown woman. Well, I don't know a great deal about these things, but it doesn't sound like much to build a case on. Oh, but that's where you're wrong, Richard. It's only a matter of time. You see, this man and this woman, the murderer and Mazard's sweetheart, are sitting somewhere hating and mistrusting each other. Sooner or later, one of them will get nervous, make a wrong move. So, it's only a matter of time. Hello? Professor? How did you get my number? Haven't you seen this morning's paper? No. Your picture's in the Times. Congratulations. Will you tell me what you mean? Don't you know about it? No. Listen, Dr. George Felix Reynolds, president of Gotham College, yesterday announced the promotion of Dr. Richard Wanley to head the Department of Psychology. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. I, I just uh, wasn't expecting it to fall. I'm sorry. Did I frighten you? Uh, a bit. Uh, is uh, everything all right? I suppose so, isn't it? You've heard nothing from anybody? No. Have you? No, uh, not so far. Oh. Well, I, I'm i not going to bother you, believe me. I, I just saw your picture in the paper. I couldn't resist... Uh, it is quite all right. In fact, I'm rather glad I've heard from you, but all the same, I think it's better if you don't call again. But she did call again. And the next time she called, her news wasn't good. Risky as it was, it was essential for us to see each other. The place we arranged to meet was ingenious, I thought. It was the 23rd floor of an office building in the corridor by the elevators. The most public and yet the most private place imaginable. When I arrived, I was relieved to see that I hadn't been followed. A few minutes later, the elevator doors opened and she stepped out. Neither of us gave any sign of recognition. Going up? Uh, no, uh, down. Professor. Oh, Professor, it's been awful. This this man came to my place. He knew. 
He knew all about everything. It wasn't the policeman? No, no. He, he said he was Mazard's bodyguard. Oh, I thought so. How much money did you pay him? All I had. He, he took my jewelry and, and the watch with Mazard's initials on it. Oh. Well, that's, that's very bad. Professor, he, he wanted $5,000, and, and he's coming back tonight. How old is he? Oh, about 35. Well, let me see. That means that in the ordinary course of events, he ought to outlive me easily. And then if he lives out as a lot of three score and ten, you'll be 60 when he dies, and that leaves you free. Not much fun left for you after that, I expect. What are you talking about? Well, paying him $5,000 isn't getting rid of him. If you pay him once, it'll go on as long as he lives. There are only three ways to deal with a blackmailer. You can pay him and pay him and pay him. Or you can call in the police yourself and let your secret be known to the world. Or you can kill him. Kill him? But it's for you to decide. Oh, uh, here's some money. Um, here, uh, here, here's something else. What is it? It's medicine. I take it myself. But an overdose... Is poison? ...brings on certain death from heart attack 20 or 25 minutes after it's administered. And it's absolutely undetectable. If I could be sure of getting him out of my apartment Well, before... that's what you'll have to do. Yes, I, I know there's... There's no other way I know that. Well, I'll be at home. If anything goes wrong, phone me. Yes? Professor, it's me. Yes? It, it didn't work, Professor. You mean... He suspected the minute I offered him a drink. He says he's got to have another 5000 by this evening. Well... Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't much more collateral. I'm sorry, but I don't know what else I could have done. I was so scared. Well, I'm sure you did all that you could. We, uh, we're just not very skillful at that sort of thing. Oh, but well, what can we do now? I don't know. I haven't any idea. I'm afraid I'm just too... too tired to think about it anymore tonight. Too tired. sat there for a few minutes, looking at the picture of my wife and children there on the bedside table. And then I walked over to the bureau and took a medicine bottle out of the drawer. Warning, it said on the label, do not overdose. Fatal consequences. Called him to halt. What did you do but start shooting? What did he have on him? Uh, Five thousand bucks in cash, some women's jewelry, and this watch. Oh, here's his identification. Huh? I can't figure out is why he started shooting. He just didn't like the idea of burning, I guess. How do you figure that, sir? This watch. This is Claude Mather's watch. <laughs> Funny. I was beginning to get an entirely different idea on this case. <laughs> Operator, is Morningside 535 Port of Order? I've been ringing it and I... Well, oh, try again, will you? It's very important. Professor Wanley, 10.30. Professor Wanley, 10.30. I said it's 10.30, Professor Wanley. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, what's that? 10.30, sir. You asked me to remind you. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thanks, sir. I fell asleep. You were right, sir. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, quite. You know, I, I can't tell you how happy it makes me to see you alive. And in such good health. I... Thank you, Professor. I looked at the calendar on the desk in the club lounge. It was still Tuesday evening. When I walked out into the avenue, it was not quite a quarter to eleven. 
The portrait was still in the window. I stood there and looked at it for a long time. So that was the thief from which that monstrous dream of mine had grown. That she was an attractive woman, there was no denying it. And then quite suddenly, it happened again, just as in the dream. Pardon me. Uh, now look here, Will I... Will you uh, give me a light? Uh, no. Uh, What's that? Uh, I said no thank you, not in a million years. <laughs> G. Robinson star of The Woman in the Window, tonight's presentation of the Colgate Tooth Powder, Halo Shampoo, Theater Romance, will return to our microphone in just a moment. Colgate Tooth Powder and Halo Shampoo express their thanks to International Pictures, producers of The Dark Mirror, for the privilege of presenting The Woman in the Window. Our thanks, too, to Mr. Edward G. Robinson, currently seen in Scarlet Street, and to Kathy Lewis, who appeared out Mr. Robinson tonight's play. Well, as long as everybody's thanking everybody, I'd like to thank Charles Vander, the producer of the Hollywood series of your Theater of Romance, for a very pleasant evening before the microphone. Oh, uh, Theater of Romance has an awfully good show next Tuesday night in New York. Your double sponsors, Colgate Tooth Powder and Halo Shampoo, have a double treat, a fine story and a fine performer. It's the Virginian and stars Wayne Morris. Good night, and good listening. The Colgate Tooth Powder and Halo Shampoo Bulletin for the Future. Next week, Theater of Romance brings you one of America's favorite stories, The Virginian, starring Mr. Wayne Morris. Keep a date with Theater of Romance for all the weeks to come. You'll always hear your favorite stars. These presentations of Theater of Romance come to you because of your enthusiastic recognition of Colgate Tooth Powder for a breast that's sweet. And Halo Shampoo to glorify your hair. This is your host, Frank Graham, saying goodnight and wishing you love, happiness, and romance.